Oh, cross branding. By featuring community heroes, creating research articles, and organizing career panels. As an award-winning community engagement program, we have received endorsement from U.S. Congress, including Senator Tim Kaine and former, Congress, former Congresswoman Barbara Comstock. Additionally, our innovator program won the U.S. Congressional App Challenge Award last year. Sorry. As part of Brand Chat's goal to promote civic engagement, community, and STEM education, we are so excited to be presenting this very informative career panel. The forensic science field will and always has been an important part for maintaining order and ensuring justice in our modern society. One of our featured pan panelists who will be speaking for us tonight is Dr. Ira Lori. Dr. Lori is an adjunct professor and research professor at George Washington University. He received his BA in chemistry from Queens College, his MS in chemistry from Rutgers University and his PhD in chemistry from the University of Amsterdam. Um, Dr. Lori served almost 40 years as both a forensic chemist and senior research chemist with the Drug Enforcement Administration. He is the author of over 80 publications, including several book chapters and a co-edited book entitled HLPC in Forensic Chemistry. Professor Laurie is the winner of the 2015 Paul Kirk Award, the highest form of the criminal, highest form of recognition one could receive from the criminalistic section of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. Dr. Laurie, thank you for being with us today. Could you please give a, yourself a br brief introduction to, to the audience? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be with you um, th this afternoon. And uh, as um, Gabriella indicated, um, I have extensive experience in the analysis of, of seized drugs, and I'm sure you've all watched on TV about uh, stories about DEA. Well, they see the agent sees the drugs, but it's the forensic chemists who actually analyze the drugs. Thank you, Dr. Larry. Our second speaker will be Mr. Daniel Katz. Mr. Katz has been with the Maryland State Police with the Forensic Sciences Division for 14 years, seven years in his current role as director, five years as deputy director, and two years as the Forensic Biology Section Manager. Prior to coming to the Maryland State Police, he worked for seven years at the Delaware Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, where he was the DNA Unit Manager and DNA Technical Leader during his entire tenure. Mr. Katz started his forensic career at the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory where he worked for three years, first as a technician and then as an analyst in both the mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA sections. Mr. Katz grew up in Wilmington, Delaware and attended the University of Delaware receiving a BS in biotechnology. He then went to graduate school at the George Washington University where he received a MFS in forensic science. Mr. Katz is a distinguished member of the Mid-Atlantic Association of Forensic Scientists and served as the president of this organization from 2006 to 2007. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and a past commissioner on the Forensic Science Education Program Accreditation Commission. He lives in Freeland, Maryland with his wife and three daughters. Mr. Katz, it's an honor to have you with us today. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Sure, thank you, Michaela. I am very pleased to be here. Again, my name is Dan Katz. I'm the director of the Maryland State Police Forensic Sciences Division. Um, my background, uh, as was mentioned, is in DNA. But since I um, went into the management aspect of forensic science, uh, I, I now am responsible for, for all the dis different disciplines within our laboratory. So um, I hope that uh, everybody will enjoy this and I can answer some questions that will help everybody um, uh, perhaps become forensic scientists in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lurie and Mr. Katz. We are thrilled to have you all with us this afternoon. I'm sure you all will provide excellent information regarding the industry for all of us. We will start off by asking a set of questions. During this time, if anyone has any questions or thinks of any questions later, you can type it in the chat and we will get to them after the set of questions. Furthermore, audience members will have the opportunity to ask questions for our panelists at the end. Let's get started with our first question. Hi, Dr. Lori. Hi, Mr. Katz. Have you ever, have you guys always wanted to study forensic science and what drew you into forensic science field, specifically into the area of your expertise? Uh, what's, could you repeat the latter question? 
um, specifically into the area of your expertise. Okay. Well, to be honest, um, when I graduated, when I got my uh, master's undergraduate degree and was working on my master's at Rutgers University, I was really looking for a chemistry job. And um, my father, I had my father, I recently got married and my father-in-law worked for the city government. And I thought a good career would be working for the federal government. So I, I applied for a, a bunch of federal agencies, the, um, the US Customs, uh, the Drug and Force Administration, and uh, I was fortunate to uh, start working in 1974 with the Drug Enforcement Administration. And um, as I earlier mentioned, DEA is just uh, responsible for the analysis of, of seized drugs, but it's much more than that. Um, one of the features that I think that a, a future uh, person who's considering a, a career in forensic science would like the fact that one of the things that I could take was going on clandestine laboratories. Uh, drugs such as methamphetamine or speed is used to be a homegrown, mostly a homegrown product. In other words, they were illegal clandestine laboratories. So one of the duties of forensic chemists is to actually assist the agents and actually attend these uh, laboratories where we would go in after the agents are secured and uh, we would look, it's like a CSI uh, episode. You'd have certain clues inside, inside the laboratory, uh, chemist notes, uh, reactions occurring, so that you wanna get an idea of what the intention uh, of the um, perpetrators in the lab were trying to make. Uh, so you, you wanted to see if they were uh, doing anything illegal under federal uh, statutes. So it's a very varied uh, career. Um, I, for one, went, went into research. And one of the nice things is I attended uh, hundreds of scientific meetings and, and also have testified in court, both domestically and in Singapore. So I've been all around the world, which is an experience uh, that was only a benefit for me working for the uh, DEA, uh, the forensic uh, scientist. It's very interesting. I had no idea you could travel all around the world doing that for forensics. That's super cool. Um, Mr. Katz, how about you? Well, um, getting into the field, uh, I, I had a bio, I was getting a biotechnology degree in 1994 from the University of Delaware, and it was time to decide what I was going to do with that. I had actually applied and um, uh, got accepted to some PhD programs, um, and, and was on the verge of actually accepting accepting one and, and going down that path of research. Um, but also in 1994, uh, forensic science was really starting to, um, and specifically DNA, I uh, was starting to get um, very known, very seen. Um, uh, you know, coincidentally in 1994 was the OJ Simpson trial. Um, that happened actually after I graduated, but it just gives you an idea of, you know, it, it was, it was good timing on my part because um, I, I wanted to be able, I was a little hesitant to go into uh, research because I had been doing undergraduate research at University of Delaware for two years. And I, it was a great experience. I learned so much, but I also learned how slow the process is. And, um, and, and that's just the nature of it. Uh, but I was looking to, for a field that I could actually perhaps um, apply science in a more real time um, uh, way. And uh, that, that really uh, drew me to forensic science. And um, I, I was able to go to a, a forensic science uh, graduate program, get just a very um, strong uh, overall uh, uh, 
exposure to all the different disciplines to sort of complement the biology aspects that I had already um, gotten as an undergrad. And, um, you know, I, I, was, I was fortunate to get a, uh, my first job at the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory, which was right outside of Washington, D.C., where I was going to school um, uh, right before I graduated. So, um, you know, I, it was a lot of really good timing on my part uh, uh, for me. Um, a lot of, you know, things just fell into place very well. But, uh, you know, I'm thankful it did because it's been, it's been a very rewarding career. Thank you for sharing your perspective, Mr. Katz and um, Dr. Lurie. My next question for you two is, how does your specialization fit within the field of forensic science and what are your main responsibilities in the field? Okay, do you wanna start? <laughs> I'll let you start. <laughs> okay, well, uh, my, my, spe my, special, um, my specialty is in um, DNA, so, uh, I, I started out as a technician um, in the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory, and what we did there actually was, a, was part of the Department of the Federal Department of Defense, and we used DNA to identify war dead, uh, which was a very rewarding um, uh, first job. And we did that through mitochondrial DNA for past conflicts. So. Um, uh, you know, we were going back to cases from uh, Vietnam and the Korean War and even World War II, trying to identify remains. Uh, and that was using mitochondrial DNA. Um, I was able to actually uh, then get a position as a technologist, which was sort of the next level, but I switched over um, to nuclear DNA, which is the more common uh, type of DNA that is used today. And that was for uh, identifying current war dead. Fortunately, uh, at that time, we were not in any, con in any current conflict. Um, so in that group, I was mainly dealing with um, uh, uh, training accidents um, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I also got a chance to uh, work on some, uh, uh, some plane crashes uh, that were uh, actually civilian plane crashes because we had expertise in this field that we were asked to, to do that. Um, so that was also a very interesting time. And then basically I had an opportunity to become an analyst utilizing both the mitochondrial and the nuclear skills that I, I, I had gathered. So um, it, it was very fortunate. And you know I think there was a lesson there. Uh, I could have just uh, stayed in mitochondrial and tried to become an analyst in that field as soon as quickly as I could, but I sort of, I, I took a little different route and tried to get a little variety. Um, and in the long run, it helped me because once I had that, I was able to get a job um, with the Delaware Office of the Chief Medical Examiner who were just starting up their um, DNA program. And, uh, you know, I, I was able, because of my varied background and experiences, even at a young age, I was able to get that position as, um, the unit manager, and I, 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 I got a lot of experience there um, and was able to build off of that by participating in, um, in, in professional meetings and organizations and presenting, um, whereas I actually uh, was uh, sort of recruited uh, by my former boss at the, at the Maryland State Police to come in as their biology manager and um, and then you know that was my because of all those experiences, I then had an opportunity to go beyond my discipline and become a manager. I become a, a, a deputy director and finally a director. So uh, my my background again is DNA, and that's what my, my specialty is. But I have um, uh, over the years, I have gained more and more. Uh, knowledge and understanding of the other disciplines. And uh, I, I feel um, it, it's very rewarding to, to be involved in all of those now. So that's a little long-winded, but that's my answer. Thank you, Mr. Katz. It's also, it's really nice hearing about all the different kinds of DNA analysis. Um, Dr. Lurie, would, do you have anything else to say for this? 
Okay, um, I come from a forensic chemistry uh, perspective, and um, I have the unique experience in that I have extensive research and practical experience. I started in 1974, and I spent seven years on the bench doing routine cases uh, at, the, at the lab in New York. Uh, what's nice about the DEA, there are uh, laboratories throughout the country in places like Dallas and Chicago, San Francisco, uh, San Diego, New York, two in Washington, and um, Miami, and uh, satellite lab in Tennessee. And by doing routine analysis, I was able to see what problems exist so that when I did research, and my research was, it was kind of interesting, is that heroin, everyone heard the word heroin. But how would it be interesting to find out what, if you look, if you take heroin and you run all these sophisticated instruments, you can actually tell what region of the world heroin comes from. We call this source determination. So that was the, uh, a lot of my work at special testing in, in, in uh, Virginia. But when you're a forensic chemist, uh, you use a field of chemistry known as analytical chemistry. Uh, and today that is using instrumentation. For example, if you're running drugs, and if you run, run, ran a CSI um, show, you might hear the term GCMS. This is a gas chromatograph with a mass spectrometry. Essentially what happens is you take a drug, let's say you have heroin and quinine, you get peaks, one peak represents heroin, another one represents uh, quinine, and the mass spec breaks it up into fragments so that you can put a fingerprint for each drug and identify it. The thing to note that unlike animal chemists who are just in the laboratory, as a forensic chemist, you actually have to testify in court as to your findings. So not only do you have to be no animal chemistry, you have to take complex principles and explain it to laymen in a courtroom setting. And that is a very interesting aspect of, uh, of one's career is being able to be an expert witness we have the leeway of not answering this yes and no questions in court, but you have to, you can elaborate as a, a, an expert witness. This is a very interesting aspect of, of being a, uh, a forensic chemist. That sounds really interesting. Thank you for covering all the different aspects of being a forensic chemist. So our next question is, what is a typical day in your work like? Okay, um, mine is, is not been very typical <laughs> due to the COVID. So um, let me say, what, let's go to pre-COVID days, because uh, that would be uh, hopefully what we're going to return to some kind of normalcy. And Mine is not typical being a professor, um, but um, let me say a typical day actually as a forensic chemist going back to my DA days. I think this would be more interesting uh, for the audience. Uh, a typical day would be to analyze evidence. And what happens is that the uh, DA agents, they'll fill out paperwork, it was called a DA7, and they'll bring the agents over to the laboratory who puts it in this huge fault. And then your supervisor would assign you evidence and you would take various cases, use their work at four and one time, put it in a lockbox. And then my full day would generally be analyzing evidence using various instrumentation and then filling out these worksheets. In the, because as a scientist or an analyst, when you do a test, you actually um, put your results on a worksheet. And these are worksheets can actually be subpoenaed in court. And then you'd come to a conclusion. And what we use, uh, I don't know if you probably have maybe had this in science in, in 
high school even, or the scientific method. Analysis is really a form of the scientific method. And one of those things is you look at a piece of evidence, you draw a hypothesis, let's say you think it's heroin, the agent thinks it's heroin, you have to prove it by doing a series of tests, and then you write a conclusion on your worksheet. And so, but other things, like I mentioned before, you can go on clandestine laboratories, or you can go to court. And one of the other things I did as a forensic chemist, I occasionally would attend a meeting. And a good meeting is these regional forensics. And uh, I mentioned about the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, I've gone to the Mid-Atlantic. And in New York, we had our own group. And we actually, uh, I remember having a meeting in a hotel in, in upstate New York. So it was kind of very interesting. Thank you for explaining the processes that you go through to analyze um, analyze materials in your job in, in an understandable way. Um, Mr. Katz, how about you? Sure, well, I, I think uh, Dr. Larry gave a, a very good explanation of what it is to be a bench chemist. Um, so I'm not gonna get too much into that um, aspect, but more again what my current job is which is which is management um uh, i i am in charge of uh of the whole laboratory operations so that you know what happened what do i do every day well it it, it really it, it it changes every day um I, it's a lot of putting out fires um uh you know dealing with things that come out that day but you know in general uh i i one of the biggest parts of the laboratory aspects of the laboratory is quality assurance. Um, we we uh, are accredited um, and we must maintain our accreditation. Um, and basically, honestly, I, I would say, you know, 25% uh, of my day is actually dedicated in some manner to quality assurance um, because we, you know, we can't be wrong. Um, uh, we're, we're impacting people's lives directly by our analysis. So we've got to be very, we've got to be confident in our methods. We've got to be confident in our um, uh, our staff, and uh, we've got to be confident in how we present uh, the conclusions, both in reports and in testimony. So uh, all those aspects uh, are a big part of my day. But you know, in in addition to that, I could be. Uh, uh, I, I could be in the legislature, uh, you know, giving testimony in regards to uh, different bills uh, associated with forensic science. I can be uh, dealing with uh, uh, individuals, state's attorneys, public defenders um, on specific, uh, uh, not usually not on specific cases, but sometimes, but in general, um, you know, working through communications between uh, different agencies within the state government um, that in the criminal justice system. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a wide variety of what I'm dealing with on, on a daily basis. You know, I usually have a list of what I plan on doing that day. And I'm lucky if I get to, you know, get through half of it because, you know, things always come up that I'm not planning, planning on. But, uh, uh, you know, and, and one thing I'll point out about the management aspect is, and the field has gotten much better in this regard in, in the past I don't know, five to 10 years of preparing forensic scientists to become uh, uh, managers and directors. Uh, but, you know, honestly, it, that's, that's something that really is, is not, it's something that has to be thought about because a scientist does not automatically make a good manager or director. Um, those are different skills and it's, but you can't just get somebody who does no experience in forensic science to be that director because they won't know what, you know, is actually going on. So, uh, you know, uh, it's been interesting. Um, I, again, I think, uh, I've been <clears throat> in a good position to gain just, uh, extensive knowledge both in regards to forensic science and management over the years, and it's worked out for me. But like I said, um, the field has taken notice of this and there's been 
uh, more of a focus on transitioning forensic scientists into management. That sounds really interesting. Management sounds quite different from working as a um, forensic chemist. Yeah, I love how like there are so many roles that you play as a forensic scientist and that I didn't assume at, at first glance. Um, for our next question, um, could, going off of the last question, could you tell us about your favorite and least favorite aspects of your job um, day to day? Well, uh, you know, my favorite aspects are, is again, the variety that I was mentioning. I mean, that's what really gets me. I, I like the variety. I also like uh, the big picture. Um, in my position, um, I, I do a lot of um, short-term planning and long-term planning, but I, I, I'm looking at the big picture. I can't get, I can't get focused on you know, just one thing. I got to look at how that is going to impact other things um, in, in our agency. So, um, you know, it, that that is what I uh, I think is fun. Um, uh, you know, what I don't I, I, there's not too much I don't like about the field. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing I would say is that it's the stress um, of the field. It is a very stressful field. Um, again, before I mentioned, you know, there, there's just the pressure of not really being able to be wrong um, uh, in what we do. That's obviously not, it's not possible to be correct 100% of the time, but you do everything that you can to um, prevent errors. And if there are errors, correct them and implement, implement measures so that that error never happens again. Um, but that's a lot of pressure. Um, there's a lot of pressure just um, in the caseloads and the backlogs that um, you're always chasing. It, it's, uh, you know, it's just part of the job, but um, it, it, it really can burn out um, people. And we've actually, uh, over the past year or two, um, coincidentally, we were doing this before COVID, but it just became that much more important after, during and after COVID. Um, that, to focus on uh, employee wellness and, um, a, a, and looking after the mental health of some of uh, uh, our, our employees and, and just making sure that uh, everybody's doing okay. Because one, again, in a, in a workplace, your coworkers do sort of become your family. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, if people aren't doing okay, then they're not doing the job. So um, I would say that is the most challenging part of the job. Hey, um, as my present role as a professor, by far the most rewarding is the, basically I retired after 40 years and I could have just retired. But my second career as a professor has been extremely rewarding. In particular, I have the ability to affect students' lives uh, going forward. What I mean by that? Uh, getting a master's uh, is really a transition to getting a job. It's come very competitive, the forensic field where it used to be uh, a bachelor's was fine. I know DEA is now hiring people with masters and PhDs, even though you can argue for routine bench work, a PhD is, is overqualified. And um, my gear for my interaction with students is that I teach courses. I teach a course in advanced instrumental analysis. I teach a course in for, uh, a forensic uh, a general forensic analysis in terms of forensic chemistry and forensic biology. And I also teach a course in drug analysis. And I also have students which I mentor in doing research using novel technology. So you get, I spend a lot of times individually with students. And my goal is that they can get a, a good job in, in the forensic field after they, uh, they graduate. And at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, uh, GW, 
uh, holds an alumni night. And the greatest pleasure is a, a student who graduated, let's say three, four years ago, comes up to me and, is, and really tells me that I was very instrumental in their career. And that is worth all the money in the world to me. Oh. As far as negatives, um, there really uh, isn't much I can talk about as a professor. I can say in the government uh, that uh, one of the things you have to deal with is a bureaucracy. And a lot of things, especially if you're not the boss, is, is beyond your control. Um, but uh, in most jobs, you're going to have bosses and you're going to have to deal with uh, paperwork and things like that, whether you're in sciences or not in science. And with bosses, you may or you may not agree with. Thank you both for sharing your perspective on the positives and negatives of this field. Um, my next question would be, what is something that you wish you knew before going into your field of study? I really haven't. As far as academic study, are you talking about? Or, or just, um, I guess so, yeah. Well, I think that the main thing is that um, as a forensic chemist, you should have a, a chemistry degree. And as a forensic biologist, you should have a biology degree. Now, I know in DEA, when I started, you didn't need a degree in chemistry. However, you needed this, the equivalent number of credits, which is as much as you would have if you got a, a, a chemistry degree. So I strongly urge you, if you're thinking of going into either forensic chemistry or forensic biology, major e either, either in chemistry or biology. I think that's good advice. Um, you know, I, again, I don't have too much, uh, when I actually went into the field that I wasn't expecting, I, again, I. I it was an emerging field when I went into it. Um, I, I, but I think it's important to mention, you know, expectations for people going into the field now. Um, uh, there are, I, I agree with Dr. Laurie that you have to have that, um, that infrastructure of having the, 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 the science background. That, that's the most important part. Um, but there are a ton of forensic science programs, some better than others. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I was previously a commissioner of BPAC, which is an accreditation um, commission for uh, forensic science programs. And, you know, if, when looking for these fields, um, because it is important to go then get a friend, I, I do think there is, is benefit in getting a forensic degree that, um, that, that supplements your scientific background. But be aware in which ones you're choosing and, and research them. Um, some are better than others. And then also have realistic expectations of what the field is. Um, one, it is very, very challenging um, competitive right now. Well, it has been for a while um, to get a position. Uh, once you get a position, you're usually in a good place to, you know, build a career. But it's a, it's a lot of times getting that first job. So you, you need to you need to have uh, a good background. You need to have something to set you apart. Getting an internship is is a very important part, I would say. Um, and then also you know, realize that the setting that you're working in is, is criminal justice. And, you know, you are going to be subjected to a background investigation and potentially a polygraph. And, you know, if you, if your life involves, you know, things that are not consistent with, um, uh, with the, you know, the philosophy of law enforcement, 
uh, you're not going to get a job. Um, you know, um, whether it's you know, a cr you know, crime or drugs, um, you got to really make sure. You know, the worst thing is when somebody gets all the way through a program and can't get a job. Um, one either because it's just too competitive and they can't get their foot in the door um, because they don't have that thing to set them apart or if they are a great candidate, but they can't pass a background. Um, so, you know, I guess that's my piece of advice um, in, in knowing that stuff ahead of, uh, ahead of time um, before you really commit, um, you know, money and time to trying to get in this field. Thank you for your excellent advice on getting um, working in this field. Your advice on um, educational background and doing research on the field you're planning to go into is really useful. So our next question is, how is a crime accident scene processed? Well, a crime accident scene. So uh, I'm not I sure when you say that. accident, I, I, I'll- uh, I meant crime I'll, or accident. What's that? I meant crime or accident, sorry for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I'll talk about crime scene um, response because in our agency, in the Maryland State Police Forensic Sciences Division, uh, we both have the laboratory um, that has, uh, has sections in biology, which is DNA, chemistry, which is seized drugs and toxicology, pattern evidence, which is uh, fingerprints and uh, firearms, as well as trace evidence, which is a little bit of everything. That's the laboratory aspect, but we also oversee the crime scene um, response. So that involves uh, for us uh, having a crime scene technician and we serve the entire state of Maryland. So it's different depending on what jurisdiction, jurisdictions you serve, but we serve a whole state. So we have uh, crime scene technicians who uh, are dedicated to different areas of the state. Um, and they are assigned a crime scene van, which has all of their equipment in it. And when we get a call for a crime scene, um, they will respond and by hopefully as quickly as possible by having them strategically placed throughout the state. And once they get there, they will work with the, um, uh, with, with the police. Um, they're not gonna do anything until the scene is secure because um, uh, you know, uh, for us at least, our crime scene technicians are all civilians. So um, they need to be wary of their safety. So the crime scene, there's always gonna be a sworn officer on the scene with them, but their responsibility is to, um, uh, is to photograph the scene, to document it uh, with sketches and to identify uh, evidence and document where that evidence is in the scene and, um, and, and finally uh, collect evidence and package it properly so that it can be then brought back to the laboratory for analysis. So, um, you know, crime scene can be uh, a very challenging job. Um, just they're exposed to a lot of, you know, not so great things. Um, it is very interesting work, but again, that's one of those things I was talking about of being aware of what you're getting yourself into um, because it can be a very um, difficult work schedule. And then also uh, the concept of uh, a vicarious trauma um, based on what you see there is a very real thing. Um, uh, doesn't mean, you know, you shouldn't do that. It's a very rewarding field. It's a very important field. We can't do anything in the lab unless we have good people in the field collect, uh, documenting and collecting evidence. Uh, but uh, just, you know, again, another thing to think about before you, uh, you, you get into the field. And just a, a, a quick comment on that. Um, as we talked about careers in forensic chemistry and forensic biology. Those are, for the most part, for example, at GW, we have a three, the most three common uh, master's degrees are in forensic chemistry, forensic biology, and CSI. 
So forensic chemistry and forensic biology are mainly where you're going to be working in a laboratory and not at the crime scene. CSI personnel will work at the crime scene. And I find that the students in, in my university that are in the CSI program, as undergraduates, do have a degree generally in chemistry or biology, just as a clarification. Thank you for your responses. You helped um, provide lots of information on how a crime scene is processed, as well as what the job entails and the education you will need. Um, so for our next question, talking more about the crime scene, um, what types of physical evidence might you find in a crime scene and how is DNA collected from the crime scene? Or to Mr. Katz on that one. <laughs> uh, it's a very good question. Um, you know, uh, there, evidence at a crime scene can be really any. Um, uh, and, and that's why the skill of the crime scene technician is so important because it's not always obvious. Okay. Um, you know, there, uh, and it might be something small, it might be trace evidence, a hair, a fiber. Or it might be something really large. I mean, you could get, um, you know, you could get a door <laughs> to come into a laboratory that has to be processed. Um, so uh, that that's the first thing. And in regards to um, uh, DNA collection, that also is, you know, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of knowledge um, because when you know, when I first got into the field, you know, like 25 years ago, when you're talking about DNA, you were, you needed a visible blood stain. They always say around the size of a dime or to a quarter um, to get DNA. Times have definitely changed. Uh, the systems that we use nowadays are so sensitive. I mean, they're actually too, they're almost too sensitive because a lot of times when we get sick, when we, when we uh, uh, take DNA samples, we get mixtures that are hard to interpret because um, they pick up so much trace DNA. Um, but that being said, you know, we're still looking for uh, stains of body fluids, um, but also nowadays we're, we're collecting for trace DNA and that just uh, um, uh, uh, touch DNA, which really is the same, exactly what it sounds like. Like when you touch something, you are transferring your, your DNA. So um, uh, it, it, could be, uh, it could be so many different things. It really could be anything because anything that they come in contact, there is the potential to transfer your DNA. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of this has become almost, you know, some samples are just, are very likely to give you mixtures that you can't interpret. Um, so one thing that we've been doing in our laboratory is we've actually been uh, studying the samples that we actually do get and we do process and determine which touch DNA samples are more likely to give results than others. And you know we've actually adjusted our our um, our policy in regards to what we will accept for testing because we know that some samples, although they seem like, you know, well, there should be DNA there. Well, there is DNA there, but there's so much DNA there that it, it doesn't do us any good. So, uh, but as far as how you collect it, um, for the most part uh, with stains, you're taking, um, uh, you're either taking a swab or a cutting if the stain is on a material that can be um, cut out. Um, and then with touch DNA, you're doing um, generally a, a swab of an area suspected of having DNA. And uh, actually that's usually a, a, a two swab process where first you use a wet swab um, uh, and, and then follow it up with a dry swab and you collect those swabs and test them. Well, thank you. Um, this is kind of related to my next question, but this is... Um, I'd like to comment um, on the last question. I think one of the tenets of forensic science is, is the so-called Locard principle. 
a, a low card was a a uh, a scientist in the eight uh, actually around the turn of the nineteenth uh, turn of the nineteenth uh, century around nineteen hundred, and his principle was that every piece of evidence leaves a trace. So it can not only be uh, touch DNA, it could be uh, fibers, it could be uh, hair, for example. And uh, so there is a whole host of uh, scientists who will not only in forensic chemistry do drug analysis, uh, but they could do, and also it's an overlap of biology, they could do uh, fiber analysis, they could do arson. Uh, for example, you, there, you could leave a trace of, uh, of gasoline. Uh, you can do, uh, like I said, hair, which involves, uh, you can do it by DNA. Uh, there's been research doing it on the, uh, uh, on the amino acids present. So it was a whole host. Uh, forensic uh, science is a very broad field. And even if you're in one thing like doing DNA or drug analysis, every piece of evidence is unique. So it's not like you're working for a pharmaceutical company and you're doing quality control where you're doing the same analysis over and over. That's not the case. And then again, that's what makes forensic science as a career very appealing. Thank you both for sharing your perspectives. Um, our final question before audience questions is, um, what was the most memorable or your favorite investigation that you have taken part in? Um, you know, I, uh, I think one of the most memorable cases that I had was actually one of the last cases that I actually worked before I got into management. It was when I was in Delaware um, and it, it involved a pretty a horrible um, uh, rape and murder of a of a um, University of Delaware student, actually where I went to went to school, and um, you know it it was uh, it was a very very interesting um, uh, investigation in which there was there was really no uh, immediate leads of who had done that done this, and and eventually um, uh, DNA. Uh, was able to be found uh, in, in the sexual assault kit that was done on the victim um, at autopsy. And, um, you know, it, it was, uh, it, 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 you know, it all came together. Um, and basically, uh, the individual who committed it, uh, you know, I, I testified at his trial. Um, and uh, he, he was held accountable and found guilty. Um, interestingly, he did appeal that case, and on a technicality, he got a retrial, so I actually testified in that case a second time, um, several years later, and, um, and it went the same way, and he was, um, he, he, he was found guilty again, but that was, um, that was an interesting and satisfying case. Thank you. It's great to hear how important DNA is in catching perpetrators. Um, Dr. Lurie, do you have anything to add? Yes, I mean, there's two cases. Uh, one was a, I'm not going to mention names, a famous baseball player. Uh, evidence came in and uh, I was asked to analyze for an anabolic steroid. <laughs> and it turned out that this person, and it was a big thing around the turn, turn of the century where baseball players were coming up with these fantastic like 75 home runs. And uh, one of the players involved with that, the players union, as a favor, DEA sent the, the exhibit to our laboratory, and yes, it was an animal steroid. The other case is that I uh, was able to travel twice to Singapore and be involved as a expert witness with Singapore government on heroin cases. And the first time I gave talks to all the uh, prosecutors there and uh, they opened up all the lab procedures. They revised the uh, chemistry lab on their procedures. Second time I went, I actually testified in a foreign court uh, for three days uh, on the analysis. 
And again, it involves taking the very complex principles and trying to make it in layman's terms. Thank you, Dr. Laurie. Um, oh, wait, sorry. What was your second case that you wanted to talk about? What's that? Do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we have one last question from the audience, actually, um, from Max Liu. How have technological developments changed the way you work throughout your career? I mean, that, uh, that's an excellent question um, for Max, because it, it is amazing. Um, the, the changes in technology and how fast the technology can change. And, you know, again, in my background being in DNA, I, I've seen that um, very, very much. Um, again, we went from a technology called RFLP, uh, which um, took months to do and needed a, a very high quality DNA sample um, to over the years getting into PCR based um, uh, analysis that becomes much more sensitive and much more quick and then again the kit the the, the testing and uh, uh, reagents as well as the equipment just keeps getting better and better <laughs> Inc <clears throat> excuse me increasing the sensitivity as well as decreasing the time that it takes to, to do the work um, so you know that's been very common in uh, the DNA field and over the past you know several years um, uh, I've seen it more and more in the other disciplines as well. Um, it, it, you know, there really was a period where things were pretty, a little stagnant um, in some of the other fields, but, but that's changed. Um, uh, and, and a lot of it came from, you know, some criticisms that came to the field over the past um, uh, decade or so in regards to uh, some, some studies and reports that were put out there that, that actually challenged some of the, you know, the long held ways of doing things. And that can be very difficult for the field. Um, one, because you're being told that what you're, do, you're doing, you know, people are doubting what you're doing and you really have to start being able to defend everything you do in court, but it all, it pushes the field forward. And, um, and, and we've really seen that. And, um, you know, in regards, you know, I won't get too much into the seized uh, drug field because that, that's Dr. Lori's specialty, but I, I know at least in, in our case, in our laboratory, um, we've been working with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, NIST, which is in Germantown, Maryland, over the past five, four or five years. And we've really, done this collaboration um, that is resulting in new ways of new ways, better ways, quicker ways of doing seized drug analysis. Um, and, and it's something that I'm really proud of our lab for. And, and it's just, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good thing um, to see the technology um, advancing. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Totally uh, agree with Mr. Katz's assessment. I think the biggest uh, change has been in automation. Um, I talked about earlier, you're doing a heroin analysis and you're getting a peak uh, off your computer now. Uh, when I started, you had what's known as strip chart recorders. And if you wanted to quantitate the amount of heroin in a sample, Rather than having the computer do it for you now, you had to actually cut out <laughs> the, the chart <laughs> paper and weigh it. Um, also, in writing, I do a lot of writing, a lot of uh, manuscripts, reports, and I don't, you can't, if you're a younger generation, uh, you, you probably can't fathom that we had to use typewriters. And in, when I started with typewriters, uh, if you made a mistake, it was really tedious to, you had to uh, have these erases, we type it over. Uh, you don't have realize what a great boom uh, doing a word processor is even. And this has a major effect. Um, when I started with DEA, uh, everything, you had these paper worksheets, 
now everything is electronic worksheets. Everything is electronic. And that, uh, that is a big ease and uh, going on. And one of the things that I work on is this new technology that hopefully someone like Mr. Katz would use in his laboratory. Um, uh, this, is, this is a question. Are you doing DART with that in this? That's, that's exactly things? what we're doing. Yes, Cisco, at Cisco? Yes. Yes, okay. So, yeah, that, is, that. that is great. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> So, all right, that will be all the time that we have today for questions. Um, just before we wrap up the panel, we would love it if our panelists have anything else that they would like to share that was not asked. Um, I, I just, you know, uh, again, wrap this up by just saying what you guys are doing is, is very impressive, very important, because we do need to always be looking to the next generation of forensic scientists, um, you know, it's it's um, we we've seen the field just grow exponentially, and that's just um, so important to uh, the criminal justice field. Uh, we've obviously seen a lot in the past uh, uh, few years in regards to um, concerns about the criminal justice um, system. Um, we as forensic scientists uh, are as are the independent um, players in the criminal justice system. There is the prosecution, then there's the defense, and our job is simply to analyze uh, evidence in an independent and non-biased manner and present the facts. And um, it's a very rewarding field that has a very important impact on society. And um, I encourage everybody to, to think about doing it. Thank you. Dr. Lurie, is there anything you would like to add? So? I'd say if you want a very uh, self-fulfilling career that's very varied in your duties, uh, the evidence, the fact that I've been uh, doing this for 48 years, and still going, I think is a testament to the fact of the great enjoyment you can get from being a forensic scientist. I'll leave it at that. Thank you both for your responses. And I believe that our audience will find your advice really valuable, especially those who want to go into like science or forensic science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So wrapping up, on behalf of the whole branch, our career panel team, we hope that everybody had has enjoyed the panel this afternoon and learned a great deal about successful individuals in the forensic science field. We hope that everybody got a chance to experience the essence of the field, had their questions answered, and maybe even become inspired to pursue or learn more about this industry. Forensic science has been a vital part of establishing a safe and just society and will continue to be for generations to come. We also are extremely appreciative of our panelists today, Dr. Ira Laurie and Mr. Daniel Cass, for their time and giving us very great insight into this field. We are also very appreciative of our audience members for making this panel so great and asking some wonderful questions. To learn more about Branch Out and our future panels, please check us out at www.velbranchout.org slash sign up or like us on Facebook at Veritas Education Leaders. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Um, also a heads up for our next event, um, we are going to, um, we have already two new events on our branch outside if you would like to check those out. Um, thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much.